Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, so this is our another uh, icon presentation and discussion uh, in a series of discussion about Great Lent and iconography of Great Lent. So um, uh, only a couple of days ago we um, uh, uh, celebrated this triumph of orthodoxy, um, which of course uh, remembered, or at least historical uh, uh, background of that feast is the uh, uh, the remembrance and the celebration by the Church of the Seventh Ecumenical Council, uh, in the course of which the the truth. Uh, and the essential character uh, of uh, uh, icons, of iconography, as um, equal to that of the written word in the revelation of Christ, uh, has been uh, uh, confirmed. So, um, uh, if we look at this uh, image uh, of uh, Christ, uh, not made by hand or holy mandilion. Um, uh, that is a very early Russian icon of the 12th century. It's called the pre-Mongolian period. Uh, uh, starting and very strong. Uh, we have to realize uh, uh, what we're looking at. And uh, 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 in that realization, we will discover the meaning of the triumph of orthodoxy. Uh, first and foremost, the triumph, the glory, the joy, the, the truth, the reality of orthodoxy is uh, uh, expressed, revealed in the person of Christ himself, in his incarnation. So the fact that the invisible uh, Logos of God, the second person of the Trinity, had made himself visible in order to unite with us uh, so that we will become one just as he and his father and his spirit are one is of course the very uh, uh, the very heart of it so um, uh, now so f uh, I remember talking to uh, uh, someone uh, uh, an inquirer from uh, a Protestant background and we were talking about uh, the incarnation of Christ and uh, uh, the way we uh, stand on the fact that uh, we believe that Christ has two natures, two uh, whole, complete natures, that of God and that of uh, uh, a human being. And then he said, well, so it means that uh, Christ is the divine person. So, in other words, the person of Christ before incarnation uh, 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 is incarnate in the human nature. Uh, and, of course, there is a trick there, uh, or rather, maybe not a trick, but a certain misunderstanding uh, of, the, of something that uh, 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 is behind the statement. Uh, 
the misunderstanding that it is in nature that uh, uh, somehow uh, dictates or uh, determines the person. Well, we certainly uh, uh, are taught that way in the modern uh, uh, culture uh, and by, uh, to some degree by modern science that it's uh, nature and nurture, so you express your nature. So the person is nothing but uh, an accidental expression. Of course, uh, Christians from the very early on would not buy into it at all. In fact, the uh, uh, one thing we can say about the nature of God is that the person, uh, any person, of course, the person of God the Father, first and foremost, is not bound by his nature. He's, he's not bound by anything. In fact, his very nature stems from the freedom of him being a person. It's really uh, 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 mind-boggling. Because, because, of course, for us, it's always the other way around. It is uh, uh, always that pattern of... Uh, uh, being an expression of one nature. Nature comes first. Well, it's true for us to some degree, but it is definitely not true about God. He uh, is, his person comes first, and he creatively, freely uh, uh, expands and uh, creates his own nature as an expression of his person. So it's the other way around. So, yes, uh, 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 it, the, our Lord is the same uh, as he was before the world was, as he is, and as he will be. There's no question about that. But it's not because he's bound by his natures, but because he, in fact, uh, uh, even in his humanity, restores the truth of that relationship, of what nature and person uh, uh, means. So he creates his nature as an act of will of his person. So it's very, let's keep that. It, doesn't, it sounds kind of heavy and theological, but we will be able to see that, uh, 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 how it, uh, uh, it works out and how important that is for us later on. So now uh, let's uh, 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 go into... Uh, uh, a kind of a historic or uh, a certain background of this particular image uh, not, be, not made by hands. Uh, now, uh, contrary to uh, legends about uh, 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 this uh, image uh, in the West, there is that uh, legend about Veronica uh, who offered Christ, uh, who was ascending Golgotha, uh, um, a towel to wipe his, his uh, face that was covered with sweat and blood. And so um, now, uh, or even the uh, certain common understanding that the, uh, the Holy Mandilion or that image is in fact an image of the Shroud of Turin. I'd like to just put it aside. Oh, well, I'm not sure. Yes, the, the word Mandilion mean, means a shroud or mean... Uh, the, the meaning of that term is an outer cloak, a covering. So, yeah, it might be that. But the, the most important thing is that uh, of all these different legends, uh, and uh, there's a, uh, no matter how you take it, uh, the uh, one legend stands out uh, by simply being more important, uh, uh, more meaningful, or more, co uh, more connected to the uh, uh, the reality uh, in the place of this icon. And that is, of course, the, the story of King Abgar, uh, 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 who uh, most of you know it, I'm sure, but very, very briefly, uh, 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 at the time our Lord uh, walked uh, among us, uh, he, uh, there was a, a king in the city of Edessa uh, in Asia Minor, and uh, uh, so he was sick, and he uh, uh, tried to find a physician who would heal him. We don't know exactly uh, what his illness was, but at any rate, uh, he was a pagan, and uh, 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 but he was a good pagan, and he knew that uh, uh, an image could carry 
the power and the presence of the prototype. Uh, so uh, uh, he knew that uh, there was this uh, very wonderful physician, uh, this rabbi who uh, in Palestine that uh, was healing everybody from whatever I illness they might have had. And he, so he sent his uh, uh, ambassador to convince him to come, uh, although it declined. So he, uh, as I said, uh, knew a, a way around it. And so he sent his court artist to go and to paint the image of Christ. So, and uh, uh, I, I like the story because it goes that uh, the artist uh, followed Christ uh, uh, and tried to uh, uh, paint his portrait, but he could not do it for some reason. And he was a very good artist, otherwise he wouldn't be a court-appointed artist. So, uh, and uh, he was, uh, he was uh, very anxious and in fear of punishment by his king, and our Lord looked at his anguished face and took compassion on him and took a towel, wiped his face and his image miraculously imprinted upon it. So uh, you know, the artist uh, uh, was very happy about that. He took that image, brought it to his uh, king, presented it to him. The king prayed to Christ uh, uh, for healing and received it. So here you are. Uh, now, why do you, uh, did I say that that image is uh, uh, and that legend uh, uh, is more important uh, theologically, more important for the church, is precisely because it reveals not only the, uh, uh, the meaning of this icon as a revelation uh, of the incarnate Christ, uh, of his, uh, but it also uh, reveals him as a healer, as a savior. He's the one who came to heal to quicken, to, to uh, bring life. And the reason for that coming is his compassion, is his love. So out of compassion, not only for the king, but for, even for the artist, he had uh, uh, made himself visible. He came to be in our midst. So uh, as uh, uh, we've discussed before, uh, there uh, there are few movements, almost like in a symphony, there are movements. Uh, uh, what do I know about symphony? It's, I'm not a musician, but uh, in fact, the, sim, uh, the sim symphonic nature of Great Lent uh, uh, are probably can be described as different layers of progression uh, uh, from day to day as we uh, go through the 40 days of Lent and uh, approach Holy Week and Pascha. So, now, the, the, uh, one of the movements that uh, 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 we are exploring is actually can be seen uh, very easily in the uh, readings uh, from the book of Genesis that is done during uh, uh, the service of Vespers on the weekdays of Lent. So this is, uh, we're talking about the second week of Lent, and uh, uh, we continue on with the... Uh, uh, with the images and the meaning of creation. Uh, so uh, our next uh, image is that of uh, the expulsion of Adam and Eve, Eve from paradise when they leave. And it's really interesting how they uh, uh, leave paradise. So in this uh, uh, wonderful mosaic uh, from Monreale Cathedral in Sicily, again 20, uh, 12th century, you can see the angel uh, literally pushing them. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting that, that he's pushing them with his whole body, just kind of a, putting his weight to move them out. And there is uh, 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 a seraphim uh, guarding the doors uh, of Eden. Uh, now, and the uh, image of Adam and Eve here uh, is changed. Uh, first of all, from being unclothed or clothed in a royal garments of uh, God's glory, here uh, they appear wearing uh, some kind of a furry coats. And uh, I'd like to uh, spend a moment talking about this because it's uh, actually it's a very mysterious, and I I never really had a chance to think more about it. Uh, uh, and right now I discovered something for, uh, that was just wonderful for me. Uh, so, now, 
Adam and his wife. Uh, uh, for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics or garments of skin and clothed them. What does that mean? Of course, they were wearing those aprons made out of, uh, you know, fig leaves or whatever, uh, just like uh, Aborigines from all kinds of places and so in warm climate. But here he made them garments of skin. Of course, I mean, there was no slaughtering of animals uh, uh, in, in, in paradise. I mean, what does that mean? It's interesting that in the mind of the church, actually, uh, uh, there is a quite... Um, uh, uh, um, uh, consensus among the church fathers uh, on the meaning of the garments of skin. What is that? Uh, some people, actually, especially modern people, would uh, uh, Gnostic oriented, uh, would think that this is a kind of uh, 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 matter. So he, they were sort of ideas. They were. Uh, they didn't have any flesh. They did not have any uh, any. Kind of a material substance and at that point uh, when they were kicked out of paradise God made them uh, 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 kind of a material. Now uh, in some sense it's not far from truth but uh, 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 yet it's profoundly different from what the church uh, 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 sees in that action. First of all that action is an expression of the all-consuming and permanent, continuing, lasting, into eternity, act of God, and that is of love. And that love expressed itself in giving the chance for uh, Adam and Eve, for, for human beings, uh, not to become demons. Uh, because if I, uh, if you remember what I said about uh, uh, the uh, the the nature of God as being created by His person, so it is the uh, uh, the personal existence in which uh, uh, everything is uh, stemming or expanding from this perfectly free will of a person. Of course, was given to Adam and Eve, and they made a choice <laughs> and uh, uh, their choice was that of negation now the, the the act of love of God preserved them from total annihilation from uh, this demonic emptiness and uh, God's gift was this uh, opportunity to experience life uh, within the confines or under the cover of biological individuality. We are not completely dead. <laughs> We're living. We are mortal, for sure. But uh, the Church, it seems, uh, very clearly thinks of the devil. We'll talk more about him later on. Uh, thank God, not, not now. But the uh, uh, devil didn't get the body. <laughs> He did not get that, that uh, uh, biological individuality, and that's why uh, the devil himself is a, a void, uh, uh, totally lacking any kind of life, because he consumed his life in separating from its source, God himself. So now he's a void, and that's why it's so vital for him to devour us, devour our lives. He is that place of hunger, that uh, uh, void, the, the black hole, if you want. Now, and the choice of Adam and Eve uh, 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 that they made would place them immediately in that very condition, at that very mode. But God gave them the garments of skin. He had given them this life that is uh, 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 temporal, that is uh, still mortality. But nevertheless, Within that life, the image of God is not completely erased. And we, uh, our freedom is not completely gone. But rather, it is an opportunity for us to exercise that freedom and grow in it uh, uh, in order to assume the fullness of that image. So, of course, all those uh, early uh, uh, 
uh, humans uh, from the Bible, oh boy, they lived long, 930 years and so on. Well, uh, we don't live that long. But at any rate, the, the very nature of time, the very nature of this world that is gripped by this, uh, in, this inexorable um, uh, crunch of entropy is still alive is still uh, is a gateway to life uh, for us. So the, the, uh, the garments of skin are very, very important. Very, very important. And uh, 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 of course, uh, again, I would like to stress that Adam and Eve were not disembodied. Not at all. Uh, it is not a kind of a, a Gnostic paradise. Not at all. But uh, uh, this biological individuality that we have uh, uh, is a cover, is a vessel within which the image of God, that person, that uh, uh, freedom is still exists and can grow uh, uh, and can lead us to uh, uh, the moment of making ultimate choice, that is to say yes to God uh, at the day of the resurrection. So, uh, uh, again, that's a bit heavy, but it's really important. So I hope that you might have some questions or comments about that. Now, uh, the next uh, image that we're going to look at uh, is uh, precisely what happens uh, 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 in sequence in the uh, book of Genesis. It is uh, the, uh, uh, the image of the sacrifice that uh, Cain and Abel, the first uh, children of Adam and Eve uh, after the expulsion from paradise made. So here we have uh, uh, again from the same same cathedral in, in Montreal uh, uh, the sacrifices of uh, Cain and Abel. Uh, now you can see that Cain uh, was the tiller of earth. Uh, Abel was a shepherd. Um, uh, they, the mode of their relationship with God was not completely gone, uh, even though they were covered by the garments of skin. Uh, that mode of offering, uh, the possibility of making an offering of love, uh, uh, it was still there. And that's, in fact, the very, very heart of our relationship with God, even to this day. So uh, they brought him uh, a gift, uh, 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 the offering uh, at, at the sacrifice. And uh, for some reason in the text, it's not exactly clear why uh, God had accepted the offering of Abel, but rejected the offering of Cain. But uh, let's look at, at the text. It's really uh, just wonderful how uh, it's all clearly expressed. Uh, again, these are the two choices. Uh, whether we love God for who he is and therefore our relationship is real or we begin to use God in order to prop up ourselves and therefore our relationship is purely virtual, purely illusory. And these are the two choices represented by uh, Cain and Abel. So, <laughs> um, uh, uh, if you do well, says God to Cain, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. You should not choose it. You should not uh, 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 bend your neck uh, in submission to that desire, to that sin, to that negation. Of course, we know that Cain did not heed to the, uh, uh, the warning from God. And so, uh, uh, and that led to the most horrible expression of our uh, uh, state of being, or state of being of the entire creation and, and our universe. Uh, in this next slide, we see the murder uh, uh, of uh, Abel. Now, we know that that murder was of, of jealousy, because of jealousy that murder was to destroy 
the very possibility, the very image of the true relationship or with God, of being a true human being. Why, why that horrible anger? Why that horrible um, murderous uh, violence? Well, because uh, uh, the very possibility that the human being is made in the image and likeness of God and to be in communion with him is a horrible insult to the one who pretends or who chooses to destroy that, choose to deny it, choose to erase it. So that's exactly uh, uh, what happened. So now you can see here uh, uh, the fallen, the figure of the fallen uh, uh, Abel. Of course, uh, again, all those things are the prefiguration of Christ, are they not? Uh, it is the uh, Abel who was a shepherd. <laughs> Uh, remember the good shepherd that is the symbol and the icon of Christ. Uh, him being killed, him being laid in a cave. So here he is fallen uh, uh, against the background of that mountain and uh, at a cave in it. So here we found this very, very interesting thing uh, that <clears throat> to this day there is a place uh, uh, very near Damascus in Syria that is called Mount, uh, well, excuse me, from, excuse my pronunciation, Jebel uh, uh, Kassiun, Kassiun, Jebel Kassiun. And this is a place uh, where uh, uh, it is believed that Cain uh, killed his Abel and dragged his body into a cave. There are actually many caves, three caves in this uh, in this uh, mountain that are. But the the cave over which uh, uh, there is that building uh, has been built uh, contains uh, that uh, cave that is called the cave of the blood. And this is our next slide. It's actually quite a horrific image. This is the cave, uh, 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 and if we look at it. Uh, we see on a, in a left image. In fact, uh, it is the mouth of the earth itself that cried in agony, being desecrated by the blood of Abel. It is the, the and in fact, of course, it's the image uh, that is so well used in, in the New Testament uh, and in the church. The whole creation cries out to God. Uh, the whole, whole creation yearns for salvation because uh, t that curse of the blood of Abel is still upon it. So um, they even painted uh, these r uh, with this red kind of stripes in order to make that uh, open mouth uh, uh, of earth uh, crying in agony. So also there is a, a story that uh, uh, the earth was so much in pain that the cave begins began to collapse and Archangel Gabriel put up his uh, hand uh, and preserved that cave and so on the right you see the imprint of his uh, hand uh, supporting uh, the roof of the cave so it will not collapse. So the the notion that uh, the uh, fall of Adam and Eve uh, uh, only concerns humans only has something to do with uh, uh, kind of a, our ethical state of being or something like that is so far from the faith of the church. In fact, uh, uh, the fall is an expression of the horrible, most horrible tragedy of which the entire creation uh, uh, suffers to this day, uh, uh, cries in agony to this day. And so uh, uh, the tears uh, that supposedly drip from the roof of that cave, uh, uh, the moisture is called the tears of the rock or tears of creation, uh, uh, reeling back uh, uh, from that most horrible violence that was done to it by uh, us, by humans. So um, what happened next? Uh, is uh, uh, 
our Lord prophesied to Cain. Again, it's uh, it's really quite mysterious. Uh, his words uh, uh, are so loaded with meaning. In this image, uh, uh, you can see that uh, the cave here uh, is that uh, naked uh, uh, child uh, between the figure of Christ and that of Cain. Uh, uh, with raised arm in supplication and plea to Christ himself that uh, uh, this is that, that earth, that is that creation, that is like a child who is being being tormented. Now, it's really important for us to realize that this is the, the, the condition of our existence. Uh, the whole creation uh, cries out. The whole creation agonizes. The whole creation is in a state uh, of this uh, collapse. So, uh, especially uh, uh, we feel that today uh, when we are praying for all those people uh, uh, who have perished or who are sick or will be sick in this calamity in Japan. Uh, uh, on Facebook, uh, 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 lots of people raise the very same question all over again. At Haiti, it was the same thing. Oh, why, why did God allow that to happen? Uh, uh, could he prevent that from happening? Uh, is he punishing those poor Japanese, uh, uh, you know, for being being infidels or something, or or he's just he's just forgotten about us and something like that? And you know, I found that there is no answer to these questions because the question themselves presupposes a kind of a pagan balance, it, uh, uh, out of which. Uh, these people try to say, well, I am better than God, because if I would be in his place, I probably wouldn't have allowed it to happen. So if he allowed it to happen, it reflects the fact that he is evil. Uh, but we should go back to the, the words of Christ himself. Remember when he said, uh, 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 calling to mind of his uh, audience, uh, what happened at that time, the tragedy of, of that tower, uh, uh, in Jericho that fell and killed 18 people. And he said, well, do you think that they were uh, more sinful than anybody else? Or they uh, needed punishment more than anybody else? So their sins were greater? No, he said. No, it wasn't that at all. So we, uh, in fact, uh, I even think that uh, this kind of agony that we feel, which is very appropriate, uh, uh, that sense of compassion, empathy, empathy to all those people who are uh, suffering in the midst of these calamities, uh, should not overshadow the fact that this calamity, in fact, uh, uh, global. I mean, yeah, it was uh, 250,000 perished in Haiti, maybe there will be 10,000 will perish in, in, in Japan, hopefully no more, but every minute how many people die? Of course, we will say, well, you know, if you, if you lived, uh, uh, then supposedly it's okay to die. No, it's not. It's, it's a very same tragedy. It's a very same uh, uh, agony uh, in which, or, or this uh, state of, of uh, mortality in which we live. And we should never forget that that uh, uh, we should not single one tragedy over the other. <laughs> They're all tragic. Uh, a child dies or a 90-year-old person dies. In fact, from a certain perspective, two are equally uh, impossible. Two are both uh, are uh, horrible in its tragic impact, in its tragic meaning. So here we are. But God had placed a mark upon Cain so that Cain won't be killed. So that, again, there, there are many ways uh, in which uh, uh, we can understand that. One of which, maybe not necessarily the most important one, is that uh, the Lord always allows the end of violence. Violence is always uh, a, an unbroken cycle. Well, you hurt me and I'll hurt you back. I mean... Uh, you, you know, of course, we, we know that. 
and then nothing changes. I mean, you blew up, uh, uh, you know, the World Trade Center, so I'm going to blow, blow you out of the water or air or mountains or whatever. The cycle of violence is never ending. It's a cycle. So what does God do here? He says, no, I break it. I break it. I break that cycle of violence. Uh, and that's, again, the pattern that we have to uh, realize and accept. So, um, and the next, uh, it's just, just uh, kind of a, a bit of an opening into the next week uh, uh, flow of uh, the book of Genesis. Uh, that is the, uh, uh, what happens after. So after uh, uh, this tragic murder, uh, uh, Adam uh, and Eve, uh, uh, well, of course, right here you have Adam on the left, then Abel in the middle, holding a lamb. Again, a very Christ-like, Christ image. Uh, and then Seth, uh, who was uh, uh, given to Adam and Eve, uh, in a sense, in place of Adam. So, uh, uh, and of course, they all lived very, very long and uh, 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 kind of a, uh, promoted and brought forth the multiplicity of uh, human beings. Now, and then, and then the next one uh, is uh, the story of Noah, and here we just uh, uh, sort of begin that, uh, the story of Noah and the Great Flood. Uh, uh, the, this icon, unfortunately, it's quite uh, deteriorated. It's uh, by, by a wonderful Russian uh, uh, master iconographer, Dionysius, uh, the 15th century uh, successor of Andrei Rublev. So, and um, uh, uh, here uh, God uh, appears to uh, Noah, singles him out, uh, talks to him, and convince him uh, 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 to do something to totally, totally irrational. Again, the meaning here is not so much that uh, uh, to prepare Noah for this extraordinary, quote-unquote, punishment by God. Uh, 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 not to make him to uh, kind of follow the path of the survivalists uh, in, in the modern time, uh, kind of a pack up certain things, you know, uh, but uh, rather uh, to uh, uh, give him an opportunity to trust God <laughs> as nobody else did. And we will see later on with Abraham the same pattern we repeat. Again, you, uh, there is this all this rationale not to trust God, stemming all the way from what the snake said to Eve uh, and Adam. But here God comes and his revelation it, uh, uh, challenges a human person to step beyond one's own survival, one's own need, one's own rationality. Uh, in that uh, uh, encounter with uh, God as a person. So this is, we're going to talk more about next week. So this is, for this week, this is that progression uh, 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 within the framework of the book of Genesis. Now, and then we go to uh, uh, Saturday. It's yet another movement in that great symphony. And uh, uh, the Saturday gospel reading uh, is that of the healing of the leper. Now, I, I, I just listened to uh, a couple of chapters from uh, this very uh, popular uh, and, in fact, very wonderful um, uh, modern theologian, uh, 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 Mirpolitan Vlachos. And uh, so, he, whose main point is that uh, uh, the healings that our Lord uh, uh, had performed uh, uh, of every kind, including the re uh, raising from the dead, in fact, were to uh, there were signs again a, a manifestation of this one flow of his love. He came to heal. He did not come to judge, but he came to heal. So he is the great physician. He is uh, coming, and in each healing, he restores not just our quote-unquote biological individuality, not only puts our nature in proper balance, as they say in the, in the Orient, uh, or in America nowadays, but to 
uh, 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 recover the true mode of human existence that is that the source of that human existence is being a person in the personal connection and communion with God. That's where life comes from, not from the balance of our own body or our biological individuality and not from our own survival, but is from that connection of our person with God. So that's, that's the, uh, uh, the progression. Now, the next, uh, of course, we go then to, sa uh, to Sunday. And uh, here is the uh, 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 couple of wonderful images uh, uh, illustrating, I, I would dare to say that word, which uh, I don't necessarily like very much. But uh, here, clearly, uh, the wall paintings are not so much icons, but uh, illustrations, iconographic illustrations of the text itself. Uh, now, uh, the, the healing of the paralytic, uh, uh, there are uh, different places in the Gospel in which probably the very same event uh, is represented from a different angle. So this one uh, uh, it might not exactly be uh, the illustration of uh, uh, this particular uh, uh, place in the Gospel of St. Mark, but, but it seems that, that uh, it reveals uh, uh, the, the, the meaning uh, and the reality uh, of that event uh, just as well. So you have this earliest image of Christ from the du Dura Euro Europos, uh, from the house church, and it's uh, about 235, so it's uh, early 3rd century. Uh, it's, it's really a fantastic image, of course, it uh, uh, reminds you uh, of uh, the images in catacombs in different places. So, uh, and you have the figure of Christ healing the paralytic that were, uh, uh, who was brought by, by his four friends. Uh, now, and in the, uh, uh, in the wall painting by Dionysius, you see Christ uh, represented in a very perfect, in a very kind of a complete form, seated. Uh, again, his healing is an expression of <clears throat> his creative action, his creative attitude toward uh, us. Uh, so, uh, son, your sins are forgiven you. Uh, here, Christ does not come as a judge saying, okay, well, based on uh, whatever evidence we have, uh, we have to conclude that you are not uh, guilty, or you should not you should not be punished, uh, or maybe your punishment, that is your paralysis, should be lifted. You've done your your time, so now it's okay. You know, go home. Uh, no, that's not that at all. He comes as the king of his creation. He comes as a healer, as the one who gives life, and then of course in fact, uh, uh, is uh, uh, a beautiful expression of his glory, his triumph, triumph of, of uh, his father, his, his glory uh, of the, the king uh, in his kingdom. That's what church celebrates uh, for the second, second time, second, uh, uh, during that uh, second Sunday. Uh, so the, the, the sense of that glory, the triumph, the, the, the gift and the love of God, we still celebrate that uh, uh, even uh, the second week of Great Lent as well. So now, so this is, this is the, the reading. And then the second Sunday, of course, has uh, another movement, another layer, and that is uh, the Sunday um, dedicated to, uh, oops, uh, to the memory uh, of uh, St. Gregory uh, Palamas, uh, who was Archbishop of Thessaloniki. And here you, can, you see the, uh, uh, the new church that uh, um, had been built uh, uh, as his cathedral, uh, and the church that, that uh, contains his uh, 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 relics. Uh, now, it's really interesting that, that uh, uh, St. Gregory 
um, uh, represents uh, uh, an, a an, es an, an essential, fundamentally essential uh, teaching of the church. Rather, it's the same teaching, but it's a uh, 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 perfect expression of the teaching of salvation, uh, of the action of God, and how does he act, and what kind of uh, encounter or, commu or communion uh, the church uh, uh, experiences uh, uh, with God. So, uh, uh, St. Gregory uh, lived in the 14th century. He died in 1359. Uh, uh, it's really wonderful that his life, all his life, uh, he uh, strived uh, for, to, for a simple monastic life. He was uh, uh, not only a protector, but he was uh, truly one of the brethren uh, of the Athenite monasteries. And uh, uh, as an archbishop of the closest city, uh, uh, he protected he, uh, 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 them, he um, uh, represented who they were and uh, uh, defended them uh, against the attacks, uh, uh, mostly led by the West. Uh, against their practice and teaching uh, of uh, uh, Christian life. So, um, St. Gregory uh, uh, was a, a kind of a luminary uh, and uh, very, very important to us, and let's uh, uh, see why. So our next slide uh, will uh, uh, re uh, show, <coughs> show us two icons but especially the one on the left. Uh, we know uh, that the, the one on the right is more popular because uh, it's been reproduced more often, I think. <laughs> uh, the one that uh, uh, is preserved in the museum in Moscow, uh, St. Gregory Palamas, the 15th century. But uh, uh, St. Gregory died in 1359. This icon, uh, 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 believed to be uh, uh, made uh, in 1371, literally, probably by people who still remember how he looked. Uh, so it is, it is uh, more clearly his uh, portrait, or there is, there is a definite uh, resemblance uh, that still lived in the heart of the people uh, uh, and the iconographers who painted that. So, uh, so here he is, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, in his face, revealing uh, uh, that unique um, uh, experience of uh, the hesychastic movement. Now, the, the, the word uh, hesychia or isikia uh, is silence. Uh, uh, it is the, the, uh, the word that actually describes uh, uh, a very unique but also very essential ascetic practice of prayer, uh, which uh, for us uh, uh, is associated uh, in kind of a very simplified form with the practice of Jesus' prayer, O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, that is being repeated uh, many times throughout the day, uh, repeated first uh, uh, aloud, then uh, in one's mind, uh, in hope, uh, uh, that it will somehow sink into one's heart so that uh, uh, that prayer, that, or rather that presence, the awareness of the presence of God that is very, very intimate, that is very near us, uh, will never fade. Uh, I always like to say that, you know, those monks really knew uh, their human nature very well and their human fate. So uh, what was the the answer to the, the dementia that once in a while, uh, or probably will grip all of us if we live long enough, is not to depend uh, entirely on our rational mind, not to depend entirely on our conscious mind, but to offer everything, including these layers and la layers, deeper and deeper within uh, the very heart of our being, to God so that that connection, that prayer, will never end, no matter what happens to us, even a stroke. But the prayer with that connection will still be there. So, now, let's look at uh, the most perfect expression of what that hesychastic movement 
uh, or teaching or rather expedience uh, is all about. So now we're going to go and look at the uh, uh, at the icon of uh, Saint André Rublev. Uh, uh, again, written not very long after the the death of uh, Saint Gregory Palamas, and uh, by Saint André, who was an hesychastic monk himself, uh, who uh, whose teacher and spiritual father, Saint Sergius of Radonish, uh, had. Uh, 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 was kind of spearheaded the that uh, monastic movement uh, in the Slavic lands. So uh, here is his work. Uh, here's this this most magnificent image, or the best icon, uh, uh, best well known icon for sure. Uh, uh, someone said. Uh, uh, to answer the question whether God exists. Uh, is very simple. If the Trinity of Rublev exists, so also God. So uh, that icon is so pure, so refined, so perfected as an expression of precisely what uh, uh, Hesychia uh, strived to achieve. Uh, and here comes another word that, of course, most of us have heard before, uh, the word uh, um, theosis or uh, uh, becoming divine, or joining or participating in divine nature. In fact, fulfilling that destiny that God had made us, fulfilling His image in us. What does that mean? It means that uh, uh, we not only reconnect, but recover that life uh, uh, of that freedom, that personhood it, within the encounter with God and the Holy Trinity. So this icon uh, uh, does not tell us anything about the nature of God for sure. It reveals to us and invites us to enter into their communion. Their communion. Uh, now, we know that um, uh, when we think about it, that I can, uh, uh, will reveal to us layers upon layers of inner meaning. Uh, the first one is that, of course, that uh, the center, of that uh, <laughs> kind of, a, um, again, the historical background of this image uh, uh, is, of course, that uh, it, uh, it depicts three angels that came to Abraham uh, who was camping in this oasis of Mamre uh, to announce the birth of the promised son. So it is a revelation of salvation. It's a revelation in the sense reaching all the way to the incarnation of the Son of God himself. Uh, uh, and in him all the, all the generations will be saved. Uh, uh, it is in him that the life will uh, uh, be greater than the number of the stars in heaven and so on. At any rate, so all of that is fulfilled in Christ. So, just look at this image. It's just so magnificent. And uh, it is Christ who is in the center. It is the image of the kingdom of God where his father made him a king. And, um, uh, uh, and we enter or partake of his presence in that kingdom. We are in his body as the church. So the icon that uh, uh, we see on the left is uh, the, the image, the figure rather, or the angel that sits on the left uh, uh, represents God the Father. And uh, you can see the difference in posture. Uh, uh, he is, he sits, the, his posture is very stable, is so tranquil, and uh, 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 he, both his shoulders are covered. Uh, the shoulders of the other two are uncovered and uh, uh, reveal uh, what is called a clavium. This is a symbol taken from the Roman Senate, uh, or even actually I think that uh, it has a, uh, a more ancient Greek origin as well, that shows the power, authority given from uh, above, 
So it is the Father's power given to Christ, the Father's energy and authority given to the Holy Spirit. So these are the, the, this clavia. Now, and, uh, uh, but for us now, let's focus on the figure of the Father, of the angel revealing to us the Father. So let's look at uh, a close-up. I have a close-up of that face. It really is breathtaking. Not only because of, of uh, uh, the simplicity of the image itself, of that uh, utmost transparency, but of that focus, of that perfect uh, kind of a wholesome uh, 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 focus in creation. He sends his spirit. He begets continually his son. He uh, uh, expresses himself in his word and in his spirit. And the other two listen to what comes from him. So, um, uh, uh, indeed, of course, this image is very uh, uh, symbolic. Uh, again, uh, far be it from us to think that God the Father looks like that. It doesn't look like anything. He looks like his son. Or rather, it is his son that resembles him in his expression, in his act, uh, in everything that he is, uh, uh, what he made visible for us. But uh, nevertheless, uh, the, this, uh, uh, I remember actually uh, listening to a podcast by Father Tom Hopko about the icons, in which he uh, claims that in the icon of the Trinity, all the faces are the same. Well, I strongly disagree with that. Uh, there is, there's, uh, it's a very, uh, it's kind of a wrong path to take. No, each person of the Trinity is absolutely unique. Absolutely uh, 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 m more than that. Uh, uh, each person's divine nature in that way is unique. Oh yes, the nature of Christ and the Spirit comes from the source, comes from the Father. But uh, 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 their faces or their persons is absolutely unique. Uh, not at all self-contained, not at all in isolation like we are, not at all individuals. Uh, uh, but they are absolutely unique. So in, in the icon of, of uh, St. Andrei Rublev, all three phases are different. But it seems to me that that utter concentration, that utter tranquility, and of course this perfect peacefulness that comes from him is uh, absolutely extraordinary. Now, there are two more images that I would like to show before, before we quit for tonight. And the next one is uh, also probably by Andrei Rublev himself or maybe by uh, uh, one of his disciples, the icon of the transfiguration of Christ. Now, the uh, uh, hesychastic movement uh, uh, was represented very often in a kind of a uh, simplified formula. And that is, well, these monks, they attain the uh, vision of uncreated light of the light of Mount Tabor. Uh, and it is, it is absolutely clear in the teaching and the experience of the Church that uh, uh, in Transfiguration, the glory that, that shone from uh, the figure of Christ on Mount Tabor uh, is an uncreated light. It is not created grace. <laughs> in fact, there is no such thing as created grace, but grace is always his glory. It is always his presence. It is that light that shone from him, uncreated light. So um, now look at those uh, uh, disciples um, who could not endure that light, who only could perceive it as, as we sing uh, uh, in the Troparion uh, uh, of the Feast of Transfiguration, only as much as they were capable of. Now, so here uh, is uh, a clear indication of a process. 
in which that can we make ourselves more capable of seeing that light or rather uh, if we go behind that formula can we uh, attain greater communion with God can we grow into the what the scripture says the full stature uh, stature of Christ yes Esikastic uh, uh, Hesychasts were absolutely unanimous about that. Yes, you can. Because it all depends on your freedom. It all depends on uh, this personal life. Not being bound by one's nature, but rather, we cannot, well, of course, being, being creatures, we cannot really recreate our nature. Uh, uh, but we can transform it by the presence of God not by our own power, but by His presence. Even our nature is transformed into what it's supposed to be, an expression of, and, and uh, uh, revelation of a person. So here you have this brilliant image, white image of, of uh, Christ on Mount Tabor uh, and Moses and Elijah uh, bowing to Him, uh, talking to Him about His pending uh, uh, suffering and crucifixion and death. So, uh, uh, but let's go back to this uh, uh, this isiki or theosis, or that uh, transformation, uh, that encounter with God, communion with Him that transcends uh, what uh, we think uh, uh, as limitations of our own nature. And here is the last image that I'd like to show is uh, uh, that of uh, the beloved saint, uh, Saint Seraphim of Sarov. Uh, this icon was uh, uh, painted by Saint, uh, <laughs> hopefully Saint, uh, I certainly am for it, by, by Gregory Krug, uh, a genius iconographer. Uh, uh, and it was... Uh, uh, painted in the early 50s. And uh, uh, to me, this uh, icon of St. Seraphim is the true icon of the saint. He was glorified in 1903. And, uh, uh, of course, during the time of so-called the uh, decadence uh, in the church art, in iconography, the time of uh, the Western captivity, and uh, so uh, he had to wait until uh, the second part of the 20th century to have his true image, his true icon, uh, to be painted uh, of all places in France. Uh, but in, uh, in a proper place, also in the uh, church that was built as a chapel for the orphanage uh, uh, for kids. So uh, what do we know about uh, uh, Saint Seraphim and why he is a true extension uh, of this or a true expression of that theosis to us. Uh, uh, most of us, I hope, uh, uh, read or heard uh, uh, the uh, so-called the uh, Conversations with Matavilov, uh, a text uh, uh, that describes uh, uh, not only Saint Seraphim's life but also uh, uh, his teaching, uh, in which uh, uh, he showed uh, uh, this Matavilov, uh, whom he healed uh, uh, previously, uh, the glory of God. And in fact, the strangest thing, he showed him this uncreated light of Mount Tabor that was shining from him. So he showed him this uh, uh, gave him this experience of transfiguration that not only refers to the transfiguration of Christ or brings us back to Mount Tabor, but in fact expands and reveals its true meaning and its true purpose that we are open to very same experience as well. And in uh, this uh, part of the conversations with Matavilov, uh, uh, Saint Seraphim, uh, said to him, uh, of course this is uh, a retelling, uh, a simplified retelling, um, he says, uh, uh, I would like to show you uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
and uh, uh, and then Matavilov uh, was looking at his face, and then he closed his eyes, and Serbian said, why did you close your eyes? And he said, well, but your face is shining like a stun, and he, in fact, goes on and describes that in, in, in this little memoir. He said, that imagine the disk of the sun, and imagine that you look at it with your eyes uh, uh, wide open, and even you know, there is so much light that the tears flow down your cheeks. And then you begin to discover that within that disk of the shining sun, there are features of the human face. And you see that the mouth and the lips are moving so that that face, that person who is shining that brightly is talking to you. <laughs> it's just an incredible thing. And then uh, uh, when Matavilov said to Seraphim, uh, I close my eyes because your face is shining like the sun. And Seraphim in response said, and your face is shining as well. So, in a sense, this is what happened. This is the, the goal and the ideal of uh, our life as Christians. This is what is in store for us. This is what is given to us as a possibility, as an opportunity, as a chance to uh, taste that life, that uh, uh, to become the image and the likeness of God uh, as we uh, are intended to be. Uh, uh, and this is the very same light that I uh, would like to uh, uh, claim uh, that we will see first as a uh, as a tiny uh, flame on a single candle that pushes and struggles against the darkness in the this uh, 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 dark church uh, uh, that in a short few weeks uh, we are going to be uh, uh, present and that is that light that uh, uh, comes out and is being brought out to us and that light that's supposed to light up the whole world it's supposed to spread and shine and not only push but devour any darkness any darkness of the fall any darkness of that tragedy anything that pertains to the curse and the violence uh, that uh, uh, is truly the condition of the world in which we live. So this is it's just so clear when you think about it. It's so clear. So sometimes we would have questions, of course, and we should. Uh, in fact, we've been encouraged to <laughs> uh, ask questions. But ask questions hoping to, to know the answer. The questions that uh, uh, are asked in purity of heart, not the ones that we are asked, uh, 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 that are assumed to be uh, uh, a trap of some sort. But uh, if we honestly question, if we honestly open our heart and our mind to, as we say, uh, uh, in the prayer before reading of the gospel, reading of the scripture, to open our heart and our mind to the, the reality, to the truth of the gospel, to the truth of the presence of Christ, then we might even taste that very same transfiguration, even in our life, even for a moment. Uh, the last thing I want to say, and I'm six minutes over time, uh, is that... Um, uh, many, many ascetics, especially, but uh, church fathers, uh, and uh, repeated that, that uh, and stressed this notion that if only we would taste that light, we would see that light, even for a briefest of moments. No amount of darkness, no amount of fear, no amount of anxiety, no amount of... Uh, 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 kind of a horror and torture and calamity in, our, in the world would be able to overshadow that joy and that assurance and that faith that we would have. So that's it. So here when we look at this uh, beautiful image of Saint Ser Ser Seraphim of Sarov who brought this theosis, made it visible specifically for us uh, by the grace of uh, God and uh, 
uh, the creative genius of uh, Gregory Krug, well, maybe we should try to apply that uh, ourselves a little bit. So here we are. Uh, uh, so next week, uh, uh, we should continue with the third. I mean, there's so much material, and I'm sorry that I'm just, I kept on going and going and uh, uh, kind of a, uh, increased the pace <laughs> Uh, of this presentation because there's so much that needs to be touched, uh, it needs to be looked at. So next week, uh, let's do it on uh, Tuesday again, Tuesday night at 7 o'clock, uh, and we will then uh, look uh, at these movements and how they uh, uh, work out at the third week of uh, Great Lent. Now. Um, so tomorrow, um, uh, we, God willing, we will uh, uh, celebrate the Liturgy of Pre-Sanctified Gifts, and it will be broadcasted uh, at 6 o'clock at night. Then uh, on Thursday and Friday, we will continue with our evening prayers. We've done that yesterday. We had seven people uh, 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 listening in. Uh, I was very happy about that. And uh, so hopefully more people would avail themselves of this opportunity. Uh, so, uh, so Thursday at 9 and Friday at 9 and then Saturday uh, at 6 o'clock vigil and next Sunday uh, at 9, 9.30. Actually, we will begin a little earlier to cover the hours as well, so probably about 9.10. So, uh, again, please pray. Remember all those uh, who are uh, uh, in distress those who have departed uh, uh, in this uh, tragedy in Japan. Uh, the, the sea of, uh, uh, metropolitan sea of Japan, of Autonomous Church of Japan, is in Sendai, the, the very city that was hit hardest uh, on the northeast uh, shore of uh, Japan. So please remember all of them, and also remember all those uh, sick and travel and those who are in distress uh, in our own community. So thank you so much for listening, and uh, uh, hopefully I will see you very, very soon. May the Lord God bless you. Goodbye.